Okay, sorry about that. We are now gonna do chapter five, part two. I got a little distracted by Theo, got kind of upset. The young Herod, I say, there was a man. It was four years after the assassination of Caesar when Herod first came to Rome. He had no army, no money, no real support in Judea. He offered only the loyalty of his house and that was enough, apparently. Mark Antony took up his cause and presented him to the Senate, citing the services of his father, Antipater. The Senate debated briefly, then declared the king, king of Judea. And 10 years later, Augustus generally, generously reconfirmed that kingship. Gratus paused and reflected. This is all part of Herod's gratitude. Caesarea, he said, spreading his open hands out over the city. And the man never stopped building. <sighs> hey, Isaac, could you pull Arabelle out of the kennel here and put her inside here? Because she's just barking in my ear while I'm reading. Gratis paused and reflected. This is all part of Herod's gratitude. Caesarea, he said, spreading his open hands out over the city. And the man never stopped building. He had regular mania for constructing palaces, fortresses, temples, aqueducts, cities. His greatest project, of course, was the new temple in Jerusalem. Built at the cost of some very heavy taxation, I hear, Pilate added. But tell me, where did he go wrong? It's a tragic history, Gratis admitted. The man eventually killed, let's see, his wife, her grandfather, his mother's-in-law, his brother's-in-law, three of his sons. Yes, that's it. But the real villain in the story was his dear sister, Salome. She was so jealous of Herod's wife that she, went, that she showed the seeds of suspicion in that family for years, concocting monstrous lies about everyone in the palace, and her brother believed them all. Your predecessor, Rufus, told me. Annius Rufus, Gratis explained. And how is that son of Bacchus? I hear he's done quite well for himself in Rome. Rufus is fine, but he told me something so ghastly about Herod, it must be a myth. Supposedly, Herod was worried that no one would mourn his death, a justified concern. So he issued orders from his deathbed that leaders from all parts of Judea were to be locked into the Hippodrome of Jericho. When he died, archers were to massacre these thousands in cold blood, so there would indeed be universal mourning associated with his death. True? Well, that was the plan, and it did get as far as crowding the Jews into the Hippodrome. But when Herod finally did die, Sister Salome countermanded his orders and released the Jews, the only good thing she ever did. Gratis pondered a moment and then continued. Herod did succeed in committing one public atrocity, though. It was in his final months, a slaughter of babies in Bethlehem, a small village near Jerusalem. You're joking, of course, Pilate said. No, no, all the male infants in town were murdered. A horrible affair. Affair. It seems a caravan of astrologers came to Jerusalem and asked Herod one of the most undiplomatic questions imaginable. Where is the newly born king of the Jews? Mind you, not a tactful, where is the new prince who will one day succeed you, but in effect, where is the real king, you imposter? Imagine what must have gone through Herod's mind. It's a wonder Herod didn't clap them in irons, Pilate smiled. Oh no, Herod was much too smart for that. He had to find his king first. He asked the astrologers how they came by this quest, and they told him they had seen a great traveling star, which led them to Jerusalem. How long ago was this, Pilate asked? Shortly before Herod's death, say about the 24th or 25th year of Augustus's reign? Precisely then, Pilate said. Thrasilus, Tiberius's pet astrologer, told me to ask about that star when I arrived here. Can you tell me anything more? No, I wasn't here at the time, of course. Well, how did the babies fit in, Pilate asked. Well, Herod consulted the chief priests and their sacred writings indicated that a Messiah king would be born in Bethlehem. So he sent them there under the condition that they returned to tell him where the regal infant was. But they suspected that the king was up to no good and they never returned to tell him. Actually, it's a shame they didn't because the only one baby who would have died, whereas Herod was so angry at being tricked that he ordered his men to slaughter every last infant in the town. So the little Messiah king died too then, Pilate asked? Yes, evidently. At least no king of the Jews has shown up in Judea since then. Every so-called Messiah who has turned up so far has been a fake, a rabble rouser, or self-appointed revolutionary who succeeds only in getting himself and his followers executed. But let me warn you of one thing, Pilate. If any impressive leader develops who speaks with authority and commands deep loyalties from a broad base of Jews, another Judas Maccabeus or better, then prepare for the worst. He may declare a holy war of independence against Rome. In the long run, of course, Rome would merely pick up a swatter and swat the Judean fly. But you and your auxiliary troops would probably be crushed before assisting legions arrived, unless you were flexible and prepared. In such a situation, Pilate replied, I'd first call in Pacuvius from Antioch, correct? Yes, he's acting legate there in place of alias Lamia, who never quite made it to Syria. Gratis smiled. Pacuvius would probably send down his legio, the 12th Fulmiata, Fulmianata, the thundering 12th legion. And if necessary, legio six ferrata, the ironclad sixth. Anything like this, like this ever happened during your term of office? No, and it probably won't during yours. 
Pilate cupped his chin in his hand and commented, there's one thing I don't understand. Why this desire for independence here? The Jews I saw in Alexandria seem content, even happy under Roman rule. They aren't, you missed the point, Pilate. The Jew in his homeland and the Jew in foreign countries are cousins, not brothers. There's quite a difference. Here in Judea, the people think it's heresy not to be ruled by their own priests. Their normal form of government, they insist, is a theocracy, a rule by God. Any foreign control is regarded as a purely temporal, temporary assignment, arrangement, a divine chastisement which will be suspended when the Messiah comes. This land belongs to the chosen people, they argue, and they must rule it. A Jewish priest once showed me a passage from their law, which clarifies this attitude. It runs something like, you must not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Gratis, your policies have certainly been successful here in Judea. I doubt that the Judeans would agree, Gratis chuckled, with the attitude of one who failed to regard that prospect of a criterion of, as a criterion of failure. Rome's been satisfied, Pilate said, or you wouldn't have remained here 11 years. Now what, now what wisdom can you leave behind to assist someone like me? Gratis thought for a moment and he replied, let the Judeans know that you are firmly in charge at all times, that you are here to act, not react, that you will brook no civil discord. Let the zealot party detect even a hint of irresolution, a solitary act of vacillation, and they will build upon it, plan around it, and hound you into concessions. Be firm, pilot, be firm. On Gratis's final night in Caesarea, a warm evening fanned by fragrant offshore breezes, a state reception was held in the gardens of the Herodian Palace. It served the dual purpose of officially introducing the new prefect of Judea and providing Valerius Gratis an appropriate farewell. A banquet would better have suited the occasion, but it was explained the Orthodox among attending Jewish leaders would not have been able to eat with Gentiles. As it was, the reception could not be held inside the palace because all Gentile homes were ritually unclean to Jews, nor is it proper for women to attend. Procula and Gratis' wife had to watch the festivities from a balcony. Gratis had ranged it cleverly. As he and Pilate stood near the center of the reception line, his master of ceremonies, using Greek, would introduce a local dignitary who was then escorted on while Gratis gave Pilate a whispered rundown on the man in Latin. The Chamberlain detained the next person in line with amiable pleasantries until Gratis had finished his brief commentary in time for the new introduction. Magistrates from Caesarea, Sebast, and other cities were presented, but the most significant contingent of guests were leading members of the Sanhedrin, the ruling Senate of the Jews. They had come from Jerusalem to meet the man with whom, or if necessary, against whom, they would govern Judea for the next years. The Jewish officials, easily identified by their lengthy beards and magnificently flowing robes, were presented with strict ceremonial regard to rank, the highest first. His Excellency, the High Priest of the Jewish Nation, Joseph, Joseph Caiaphas, the Chamberlain intoned, after an almost cordial introduction and when the High Priest was just out of earshot, Gratis quietly commented to Pilate, Caiaphas you can work with. He cooperates with Rome. It took me a long time to find him. His father-in-law, Ananus, or Annas, the real patriarch and power behind the priesthood in Jerusalem. Annas probably didn't show up because I removed him from the high priesthood shortly after I became prefect. Ha! After that, I appointed and removed three other high priests until I found Caiaphas. But choosing him proved to be a good compromise because it placed Annas. It placated at Annas. The high priesthood was returned to his family through his son-in-law. Rabbi Eliezer of the Chamber of Priests. After Eliezer was introduced and moved out of range, Gratis whispered, he's an ex-high priest and one of those I sacked. Amazed he came. Rabbi Jonathan of the Chamber of Priests. Now here's a son of Annas who shows good promise. Gratis confided, if Caiaphas ever gives you trouble, you might dismiss him and appoint the, this Jonathan. Rabbi Ishmael ben Fabai of the Chamber of Priests. A handsome personage, um, scented satins, presented himself for introduction, chatted a bit and moved on. Another of my former high priests, Gratis disclosed, and a pious and good man, though he has a problem with his sons. Rabbi Alexander of the Chamber of Priests. Rich, very rich. Rabbi Ananias ben Nabadias. Quite a gourmet, this one, and what a table he sets. I've enjoyed one of his feasts. We went through 20 casks of wine, as many roasted calves, 30 fowl. But here comes Helsius. Rabbi Helsius, treasurer of the temple. An honest priest he is, a good man to have in charge of the treasury. Now, Pilate, we've met all the members of the highest chamber of the Sanhedrin who made the trip here. The next group, here they come, are the scribes, member of the second chamber, some of the wisest scholars in the East. Rabbi Gam Gamalia of the chamber of scribes. Gamalia is the finest of the lot. His grandfather was the famed Savant Hillel, who emigrated here from Babylonia shortly after Caesar's assassination. In breath of knowledge, the Jews feel Gamaliel's another Hillel. Rabbi Jochanan ben Zaki of the chamber of scribes. He's been studying the law of the Hebrews for almost 40 years. It's been said if the sky were parchment and all the trees of the forest pens, they would not suffice to record what Jochanan Benzaki has learned. A modest claim, Pilate smiled. Benzaki turned and frowned at Pilate and Gratis, who were so caught up with the story that they had raised their voices somewhat. 
The rabbi, it seemed, knew Latin. Finally, members of the Chamber of the Elders were introduced. The lowest of the groupings in the Sanhedrin, names like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, were announced. But Pilate had by now given up any hope of trying to remember all the Sanhedrists during this inaugural meeting. It was Joseph Caiaphas who sought out Pilate later in the reception. Rather adroitly extracting him from Gratus's shadow, the high priest sounded out the prefect on his intended policies for Judea. Pilate let several harmless platitudes camouflage his real plans, which he did not intend to lay before the only man in Judea who might block them. He promised a general continuation of the principles of the Gratus administration. It seemed the safe, the convenient thing to say at the moment. At least Caiaphas appeared contented. Pilate was merely satisfied that his Greek seemed to be holding up. Naturally, we've been very concerned about the emperor's attitude toward Jewry ever since his expulsion of the Jews at Rome, said Caiaphas, and we fear that this appointment of a new prefect might, slightly, might signify a change in the policy also for Judea. We hope this is not the case. Before Pilate could comment, the high priest continued, with proper respect for our traditions, which date back to Moses, there is no reason why Roman and Jew cannot dwell in peace with this sacred land. Pilate agreed, but wondered if the olive branch, olive branch waved by Caiaphas was as much a diplomatic screen as his own efforts. Yet the two men had met, the pair who would virtually control Judea over the next years, and this had been the primary purpose of Gratus's reception. Early the next morning, the local auxiliary cohorts assembled for review in the drill grounds near the Herodian Palace. Valerius Gratus bade his troops farewell, commending them for their loyalty and service, and officially transferred his authority to Pontius Pilate. Then, quavering from a fresh chill due to his malarial condition, he wished Pilate and Procula good fortune, escorted his wife onto the waiting ship, and sailed off to Rome, which he had not seen for 11 years. End of chapter five.